General Obist, Marcus Wolf, who, by the way, was very careful to dress as General Obist. You, you, you know what it's like when you're dressing a German general. They, they do like to be addressed properly. So, um, uh, MI6. You, uh, you must be correct. MI6 didn't understand this. I mean, they keep lecturing me about, uh, Michael, you know, you've got to be nice to the Germans. And they, they go and have this interrogation with Marcus Wolf, and they're jumping all over him. And of course, I address him as Herr General Obest. And you like that. Well, there's no point. If you're interrogating somebody, no point upsetting them. Uh, MI6 wanted to arrest him, absolute farce. Uh, the interrogation of Marcus Wolfe on Ebert Heath lasted 15 seconds. I just turned around, put my arm around him and said, uh, well done, Marcus, on Ebert Heath. It took us 60 years to spot him. <laughs> he said, just said, Danke. He had nowhere to go. Interrogation over, we just carried on having a drink and chatting about his new wife, and who was also present, and, and uh, other, other, other matters. It was all very pleasant. Uh, you don't need to get the thumb screws out. I'm a barrister. I'm not allowed to do that anyway. There are rules about barristers torturing people. <laughs> Buy him a drink. Um, asked somebody nicely. Um, in that case, I, I knew Ebert Heath as a German spy, um, but it, some people in MI6 were querying my analysis. So this whole meeting had been set up, and there was one bloke from Six who was in on the, in on the loop and just smiled, and another bloke who wasn't, who didn't realise Ebert Heath as a German spy, <laughs> nearly fell out of his chair, uh, much to Marcus's amusement. Um, I generally find that there's absolutely no point getting upset in intelligence. Uh, there is very little point personalising things. Uh, Marcus Wolfe was responsible for the deaths of a number of MI6 agents, but uh, there's absolutely no point if you're trying to get intelligence out of him, letting that affect your judgement. You have to be objective, you have to be cool, uh, and uh, if you're going to allow emotions to run away with you, uh, by and large, you, you know, if you let your heart take over, uh, the head gets left behind and, and uh, you know, you're going to be outmanoeuvred. Uh, outmanoeuvring Marcus Wolfe was one of, my, I, one of the achievements I'm most proud of in intelligence. <laughs> you had to, get up very, had to get up very early that morning. Uh, you know, if you're dealing with somebody with Marcus Wolfe's level of intelligence, you don't, uh, you don't go in with this, um, oh, you've been responsible for killing, what about Bill and what about Bert and uh, I lost Henry 30 years ago on the Berlin Wall thanks to you. Well, that, that's just nonsense. That's not going to get you anywhere at all. Um, the Germans also pursued a hot war strategy. Uh, this would normally involve uh, surprise attacks, for example, the Korean War. Uh, we now know that the Germans controlled North Korea. They still do. DVD controls North Korea. The uh, chap in Pyongyang is just a puppet, reports to the Germans. Um, and the Germans, all the strategy for North Korea in, in '50 was done by German military officers. Um, German intelligence uh, largely controlled North Korean intelligence. They set it up. Uh, and Major General Adolf Galland, as there is a naval... Um, former naval officer here, a retired naval officer who was well aware of the German involvement in the Korean War because um, on his aircraft carrier, HMS Ocean, back in the Korean War, uh, they were able to monitor the MiG radio frequencies and they were uh, using expressions like Achtung Sieber, which is a dead giveaway. Your average Russian pilot or your average Chinese pilot does not go around saying Achtung Sieber when he's about to be jumped by a bunch of F-86s. Uh, I was actually told that story for the first time by someone present this afternoon and it clicked with a other bits of intelligence I had. Intelligence gathering is often a long, slow process, and sometimes you don't see the jigsaw. You get a piece here and a piece there, but that just lit, lit, fitted in very nicely with a piece of intelligence I'd got from a colonel who'd flown B-52s over Hanoi, who said, Michael, I flew B-17s over Berlin, and I flew B-52s over Hanoi, and I can tell you the people organizing the air defenses of both the cities were the same. So look, the tactics were identical. Everything, everything about the, the uh, it, it just was so very familiar to me. And one of the reasons I survived Nam is because I knew what the bad guys were doing because I'd been there before. And uh, that was true. It was Major General Adolf Galland had organized the M15, MiG-15 boys in Korea, and he had organized the air defenses of Hanoi. And if you look at his, uh, his CV, you'll see a gap during the Vietnam War and a gap during the Korean War. Uh, a recent, uh, later man who became later Inspector General Luftwaffe, an ME262 pilot in World War II, who flew MiG-15 as a career, died only last month. And if you look at his obituaries, published obituaries, um, the, the gap in the, in the CV for the Korean War is farcical. I think they had him down as basket weaving, um, or uh, lace making, or uh, gardening, or something. You know, uh, Nothing to do with what he was actually doing, which is out there in Korea shooting down British and American pilots. Now, the Vietnam War, identical. Um, the, the Ho Chi Minh was a German spy. Uh, China, the same. Mao Zedong and Shou Enlai were both German spies, recruited at a very early age. Mao Zedong was into little girls, um, very easy to recruit. And uh, the Germans have largely controlled communist China 
since then. The Cold War strategy, the German strategy in the Cold War was to try and get the British and Americans to fight each other. So the hawks on both sides very often ended up reporting to Germany. You'd have a hawk who was coordinating, with, you'd have a Russian hawk coordinating with an American hawk, and these hawks were talking to each other. McNamara, another German spy. Uh, the Germans were organizing the Vietnam War from the North Vietnamese side, but they also had their spies in Washington. One of the reasons why I'm welcome in the Pentagon, because we are doing analysis of what happened in the Vietnam War. The Americans need to understand, because they're fighting another similar war, and we see similar tactics being used by the Germans over Afghanistan. German assets in London and Washington proposing completely pointless strategies because the Germans are backing uh, the Taliban. The EU, another German strategy. Uh, uh, John Foster Dulles was very critical. Uh, the, the real key people on the EU were uh, uh, John Dulles, German spy, Jean Monnet, German spy, and Albert Speer. And it was largely these three, I think, who cooked up the idea of the EU. Uh, the notion is you undermine sovereignty, you, you, put, you create a super, if you can't undermine a state completely, uh, and you have a supranational authority, and if you control the supranational authority, then you control all the member states. That's what the EU is all about. Uh, the EU is, of course, a complete nonsense. The sooner we leave, the better. Uh, the, the current cost to the EU is about £185 billion pounds a year. Um, the public and the political class are slowly becoming aware uh, of the total costs, and I very much hope that... Um, after the next general election, we'll have a sensible government which will pull us out of the EU. Moving forward rapidly, as I'm running out of time, I see the chairman is starting to stir. Uh, where do we go from here? Uh, well, what we have is a murderous German intelligence agency called the DVD, which at the moment is into drug running, kiddie smuggling, like Madeleine McCann, um, organizing wars, controls the Taliban, controls Al-Qaeda. <clears throat> One of the reasons we know it controls Al-Qaeda is the Americans put a satellite. The Americans love satellites. And I, God love them, so do I. I mean, satellites are wonderful collecting intelligence. Uh, the Americans aren't so hot at human intelligence, although they are getting, I have to tell you, they're not that bad. Um, on my last trip to the States, um, uh, you know, they can set up meetings very beautifully. I just pulled in off, I, I was on I-70 driving east, and I drove 3,700 miles, and I just pulled in uh, to uh, a McDonald's. Uh, I'd announced that I was going to be at this particular McDonald's, uh, get my burger and fries, be ready to fuel myself up for the next 300 miles, and find myself sitting next to a member of the Cryptologic community. <laughs> We have a discussion. The chances of me sitting next to a member of the cryptologic community having discussions about um, Al-Qaeda uh, at a McDonald's uh, in Colorado are not that high, frankly. Uh, that was all obviously set up very, very beautifully. So the Americans do hear it actually surprisingly well um, at, at times. Don't, don't underestimate them. But they are very, very good at satellites. Uh, the Americans only finally understood and only finally bought my analysis on Germany controls Al-Qaeda when they put a satellite over the office in Germany. They said, Michael, give us the coordinates of the office. Here are the coordinates, boys. Where is it? There it is. Bird overhead, Al-Qaeda walking in and out. They just caught them on camera. By the time the Germans realized what was happening, it was too late. Uh, very difficult to explain why senior Al-Qaeda figures would be walk walking in and out of an office in Munich. Now, what's Al-Qaeda? What business has Al-Qaeda got in Munich? Uh, they weren't there for the beer festival. Officially, they didn't drink. Uh, I mean, it was, it was, uh, that, uh, eyebrows were raised when I got somebody to have lunch with Osama bin Laden. Uh, the Americans were looking for Osama bin Laden, so we had somebody around for lunch. That's, that's, we're British, that's how we work, Harry. If you want to find out what somebody's up to, we just go around and have lunch. The Americans were looking for him with special forces in Waziristan, hundreds of miles from where he was. We found out where he was in a Pakistani safe house. We found out where he was, and we just slipped in so somebody to have lunch. So I popped over to the Pentagon and said, right, we had... You know, we were having a chat with Bin Laden the other day. What do you mean you're having a chat with Bin Laden the other day? Well, I wasn't. I'm not allowed to have that chat with Bin Laden. But we slipped somebody in from the old days in the Soviet anti-Soviet campaign in the 1980s who knew Bin Laden well, and uh, he just popped round for lunch. And this is what Bin Laden's up to. Uh, he, by the way, is dead, taken out in July as a result of an internal DVD decision to eliminate him. He turns up to rendezvous in Waziristan and is now an ex-terrorist. He has fallen off his perch. And a wonderful thing that is, too, for everybody, apart from him. Now, there are two ways out of the current mess. Uh, we're already fighting a war with Germany. It's just an undeclared war. We're losing casualties. We're losing 30,000 casualties a year to the drugs war, largely controlled from Germany. The Americans are losing 300,000. Uh, we're in a war whether we like it or not. There are two ways out. One is a hot war. Uh, one is a deal. But a deal, or a German closure of their intelligence, uh, a dismantling of Al-Qaeda, dismantling of all the paedophile networks, uh, handing us over lists of their agents,